Jen. Thanks, Jen. So as you heard, we are recording the session for those that can't join us or we're hoping they could and we're not able to. Uh, we'll be putting this up on our YouTube channel in the next day or two. Um, and you'll probably all be receiving an email after this with that link if you don't have it already. But this is the uh, December version of the Community Sharing Roundtable by PD Active, where we will be discussing the results of the, I think, fourth annual, right, Chad? Um, PD Active member survey. I hope, hope uh, did I, does everybody know what we're talking about? We can show a raise of hands, no, took the survey and responded. Excellent, good, I think that's a full house. Good, so uh, again, we started this in 2019, um, Chad, sort of the, the ringleader of, of collecting the responses and coalescing them into a good readable fashion, which he's done a great job of here. So we'll be seeing the results of that. Um, he and I will share some of the presenting presenting of the slides, but uh, we'll let Chad get started. Uh, Chad, if you'd like to share screen and dive right in, go for it. Okay. Okay, so um, let me. All right, so what we're going to do today, we're going to, as Todd said, review the 2023 stakeholder survey. Um, there's a section on demographics, who we are, um, current programs and services. Uh, our change for dropping fees in online classes, support groups, new programs and services, and we have a little to say about the other comments provided. Uh, and then we're going to discuss some recent actions taken in response to survey feedback. Is that all good? Um, people can ask questions. Uh, um, in the course of this presentation, you can uh, raise your hand. I think there's a, you can do it just like this, or you can. Uh, there's a way to do it um, in Zoom. There's a raise hand, and and Todd or Jen will interrupt me, um, or you can wait till the end. So um, as Todd said, we've been doing the survey since 2019. We had town halls before that um, where we got um, lots of uh, member feedback um, in a uh, not as organized, not as easy to collate the results uh, fashion. Uh, but um, uh, some of you may recall uh, those sessions. Uh, we sent to the entire membership list, which is many hundreds. Uh, we received uh, the most responses we've had of any of these annual surveys, 214. Um, so that was great. Um, we expect that the most engaged members provided most of the responses. Um, so there's a lot of other people in our mailing list um, who may not be quite as um involved with all the programs. and uh, But we expect you guys are the ones that provided uh, the good feedback. So demographics, who are we? So um, three quarters of the people, you see the green um, in the pie chart, uh, are people with Parkinson's or Parkinsonism. Um, you can see we've got uh, the blue 15%. Uh, care partners, um, and then uh, friends and family, and uh, and a couple working within the PD community. So this is the distribution by age. I've got a couple of slides like this. So uh, what what everyone should be doing is looking for where are they in this chart. Um, I just turned 60, so I'm, I'm part of it, this bar here. Um, 
but figure out where you are. You can see the distribution. We've got people in their 50s up to someone who's 94 um, respond to the survey. Uh, the median is the middle value. So where half are older and half are younger. And remarkably, that has stayed steady at 72 years, despite the passage of time. It doesn't mean that we're not getting older. We think we're getting older, but we have new younger people joining to keep the average 72. Chad, it looks like A. Robin has a, her hand up. Oh, uh, yes, A. Robin, you, uh, yeah. Yeah, Chad, I think I may have asked this question in previous years. Um, what we don't have a membership procedure. There's nothing that constitutes I'm a member or I, you know, give me a dollar and you're a member. What 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 are you basing membership numbers on in this survey? Is it anybody who shows up? Well, the 214 that I quoted is people who've taken the survey. Um the full member community membership, we use the term loosely. As you say, there's no official, there's no fee, there's no form you need to find to sign to be a member. Um, so that's you know well over a thousand. Um, but um, but that's informal. The 214 that I quoted are people who took the survey. Okay, thank you. And hey, Robin, I, I think we've loosely called a member anybody whom, for whom we have an email address. That's what I was wondering. Those would be different numbers. Well, we, like Chad said, we don't have a formal membership uh, form to right. fill out or autograph. Right. So, so uh, Chad, just to be clear, this age distribution is only for people in the respondents of the 74% who actually were people diagnosed with PD, not the other 25 who are- That's dead. right, that's okay. right. Yeah, yeah, good question. Okay, good um, question. The people who work in the PD community, friends, family, even care partners are not included here. Years since diagnosis, um, uh, again, find out where you are in this chart. You can see in the early years, in the first, 14 years is where we get most of the people. Um, and uh, and in the first couple, we get even more. Um, and again, you know, we're getting we're getting more into it, but we have new people um, joining the group uh, and taking the survey. And again, um, I consider it a sign of health that we're uh, we're holding steady at a median of six years. We have a lot of new diagnosed people who are getting involved with PDF. And we're still serving the people. Look at this, someone 27 years. There's probably someone out there um, who who's even longer who didn't take the survey. But 27 years. Age of diagnosis. This is the last one of these bar charts like this. Um, uh, you can see most people are diagnosed in their 60s or 70s. Um, I'm part of this young onset group. Find out where you are on this chart. Um, we got a couple of young onset here on the call. We got a couple of people who are diagnosed much later. But um, uh, well, you, you can see the distribution. Uh, this is by zip code. Um, it's not actually your street address. So when we zoom in, you'll see that. But um, the height of the, of the block uh, represent how many people in that zip code took the survey. Um, you can see we're concentrated in the Bay Area, but uh, have people all throughout the country. And then if I zoom into the Bay Area, again, it's not the exact address. This is just the zip code location. But you can see 
a lot in the East Bay, a lot in San Francisco, but a good number throughout the Bay Area. Um, it's hard to define what our old fashioned um, service area was. Um, you know, a, a lot of the people were in Oakland and Berkeley uh, before the pandemic. Um, but there's something called ZIP3, which is just simply the first three digits of the zip code. And you can see in this little map over here, I, uh, I blackened out the area that corresponds to 945, 946, and 947. Um, so it's a reasonable approximation of what our old fashioned service area used to be when almost, when everything was in person. And in 2020, I wish we had 2019, um, but um, you can see 2020, uh, we're starting to get the pandemic and we had almost 13% of the people outside of this area. Um, 2019 and before, it would probably be even smaller. And then with the pandemic, this shot up and we have we have now about a third holding steady at about a third of the people are outside this old fashioned um, th this old time notion of 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 our primary service area. So um, so we have a nexus in this area, but um, we're we're spreading out. Any questions on this? Um, which race ethnicity uh, best describes you? We're trying to make sure we service our community as a whole as best we can. Um, we know that white and Caucasian represent um, more of our of our um, active participants, more of our survey takers than the share of the population in this area. Um, but you can see here who the people who took the survey, 88% white Caucasian, the way of Asian, multiple ethnicities, um, Hispanic, Black, African American, uh, no American. Um, what I do is every year I look and see we have an objective to expand our outreach to serve more um more uh of our community and we are making um uh slow but steady progress at um at uh expanding that uh that ethnic community that we're serving it's an encouraging slide i thought i take i take i take yeah. this at heart all right, current programs and services. We asked people to rate how important various um, services and programs are at a high level. Um, you can take some different things from this slide. You can see the most important um, ratings are somewhat important, important or very important are the things that I've circled in black. And you can see that news and information, the speaker series, this presentation is one of those speaker events, um, are the most, almost everyone values these as important. But another takeaway from this is that all of these programs, classes, support groups, community social events, have a large number of people that find them important. So just because community social events um, is fifth on the list, there's still over 70% of the people find these services important. And, you know, almost 20% very important. So we're not cutting anything. <laughs> Uh, for the last couple of years, we've been 
trying to gauge um, when we return to in-person classes. Um, and so we've asked um, what people favor, how people would prefer to attend classes in the next 12 months. That's sort of some sense of in the foreseeable time horizon. Um, and there's really a mix. Um, you can see for movement classes, um, there's probably, uh, there's more who are interested in, in just in person. Um, but even for movement classes, there's a large percent in blue. There's almost 30% of people that want online only. And the biggest share of all these is the people that want a mix of in-person and online. All this was unimaginable in 2019 and before when everything was in person. Um, now um, we find um, a lot of people really want to come back and meet in person and do these activities in person, the, the social connections. But a lot of people also prefer the convenience of not having to get out of their pajamas and and uh, leave their home um, and find parking and, and all. So there's really a mix. Uh, many of you know, maybe all of you know that um, we had a evaluation of a change um, last year where we were trying to figure out should we drop the fees in many of our Zoom classes. Zoom-based classes, it's easier for us to drop the fees because we don't have to pay rent and it's easier for the instructors to, to um, have a variable number of, of, um, of students. And um, so we surveyed the community. Is again, this is one of the reasons for this is to reach out to more people, make it easier for more people to take our classes. Um, and um, and this last year, we surveyed um, you all to see how it's going. So we made the change to drop fees um, for all the PD active organized Zoom-based classes. Um, and uh, you can see 22% of the respondents said it allowed them to take more classes. That's good. That's what we want. 18%, um, same number. Um, you can see there's always some people, a lot of people who don't participate in classes, they participate in other things we offer. Um, other comments we'll talk about later. Carrie, you have a question? Yeah, um, this specifies Zoom-based classes and maybe it, I can't remember if it addresses non-Zoom-based classes later because we dropped fees in that too. I mean, we encourage payment if people can afford it, but it's not necessary. Right. Um, I don't have, the questions in the survey were all about the, the Zoom classes where we dropped uh, the fees. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So for the survey, it's all just a discussion of the Zoom-based classes. Okay. No, I just wanted to make the point that really all classes are free if you can't afford to contribute anything. Right, right. Yeah, and there's, um, it's a little bit, um, um, like in the past, we always said that, um, you know, people could apply, you know, for, you know, for for paying less, for paying what they could afford. But we made it much more explicit um, that classes, you know, you don't have to feel guilty. You don't have to feel, um, you know, yeah. you're, you don't have to feel guilty about not paying anything for class. We're, of course, based on, um, we survive based on generous donations, um, and um, many of you have been 
donating in this last uh, month or two. Um, but um, but yeah, in the Zoom class, in these Zoom classes, we um, we explicitly say there's no fee. And thank you, Carrie, for pointing out that, that we dropped other fees too. Uh, a whopping 33% said it encouraged people to try one or more classes that they might not have otherwise tried. That's great. You know, that's what we really want. Um, that was the goal behind that uh, objective. And really, it, it shows that, you know, what we wanted was to make classes accessible to any and all. And as this green bar grows, that means that that's been a successful adventure. Right. And, you know, maybe there's something that people really like, but they never would have signed up for because they felt they had to pay $15 to try it. And now they tried it and they like it. Uh, PD Active relies on donations for all programs. Uh, it's very important. We can't just drop all fees and stay operating forever unless people donate. And another 33% said they expect to donate more. So this would help make up for the reduction in fees that we have. I expect the 2% who said they're gonna donate less. That's maybe financial reasons, um, not having to do with this change. Margo, did you have a question? I did. I wondered what the average donation is. Jen, do you have that? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But anything is appreciated, and <laughs> and I think I you know many of you still have that envelope that you got in the mail. Um, anything is appreciated. More, more does more, but uh, anything is appreciated. Support groups. We asked a bunch of questions on support groups, and Todd is going to do this. Todd, you just tell me when to advance the slides. Great. Dive into the first one. <clears throat> so we wanted to know which, I mean, to start to give us a baseline, which uh, support groups folks had attended in the last year. And not surprisingly, our biggest one has been the the general support group at 27 plus percent. Um, and then you can see the numbers as they drop down. Uh, the This uh, one piece of information that this shares with folks like you getting to see it like this is first and foremost, how many support groups we offer. So I don't know if folks listening in right now were aware that we have eight at least. I thought we had nine, but I'm counting, I think, eight here support groups ranging from the mild to moderate care partner support group, young onset, a new one in deep brain stimulation support group, um, a new one in the connection, uh, the, the Spanish support group, and then African-Americans living with Parkinson's. So this helps us to at least uh, have a baseline of understanding uh, about how much our sport groups are being used. And uh, another interesting piece of data you can glean from this is that uh, it may look like bad news that 50.6% of the respondents have not responded, have not participated in a pediatric sport group in the last year. Well, the flip side of that is pretty encouraging, and that is that half of you have. And if this is representative of, I mean, we've only got 200 plus respondents here out of, well, I guess we're we're approaching 2,000 total members, maybe not quite that many yet. But if this is representative, as we as we are safe to assume it is, then half of our members are taking support groups or approaching that. That's pretty exciting. So, and the fact that these numbers are that strong means that people are um, liking them enough to stick with them for a while too. Thanks, Chad. Next slide. I think Sorry, Carrie has a question. Oh, yeah, please chime in. Oh, did you say me? Yes. <laughs> Carrie, okay, first. thanks. Um, when you said nine, you might be thinking of, there's also, um, we are starting to form the women's group. Ah, uh, that might be group. the ninth that I was, that was lingering in the back of my mind. Uh, yes. There's nine on that page. The, the women's group will be 10, yeah. 
Um, we so there there are two other support groups that aren't on this list: the um, the Heart Circle and the PD Salon. And so those might be what you're thinking of, Todd, as well. Uh, they're not, but I'm really glad you brought those up because those those are where the folks know about them. Yes. And I see eight support groups. The first one is not a support group question, but anyway, moving on. This is this and is still David exciting. has a question. Or, or David and Marta. David's wife. Yes, thank you so much. I'm just wondering, you know, on the mild, moderate versus the advanced care support groups, are those self-selecting? Everybody just decides which you know one they belong in, or is there any oversight on that? Who would like to take that? Chat, chat. Do you, oh, I was going to say, do you mean um, who answered the survey? Because the people who answered the survey answered based on what what they attend, I'm guessing. Um, yeah, but uh, we Marga do. Means, I think Margo means participation in the support group. Right. Right. So, we, um, we don't you. have the facilitators on the call, but as I understand it, it starts off self-selected. Um, but what does happen and this is something that we've struggled with um, is, you know, people's symptoms advance. And so people might start off appropriately in the mild, moderate care partner support group. And then five years later, they probably um, would be better in the other one. But they've made so many friends and relationships in the group they're in. So... Um, we struggle a little bit with what to do in that situation. Um, I think uh, there's talk about creating another one for very mild. <laughs> Um, the co the coordinators you. also do help support people and um, and try to figure out which support group is a best fit for for people who need uh, a care partner support group to decide which one is a better fit. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next slide. Yep. This is specific to the general support group. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to breeze through this a little bit quickly because it's a, a smaller subset maybe of all of our attendees here today. But uh, we did want to know because we had heard that there were some um, questions about how this group could be changed to make it more efficient, um, what folks in that group thought might help make it that way. Um, this, of course, was only asked to people who participated yes. in that group right so that may be that may be a majority of the folks attending here today but uh the uh, there's some interesting ideas and this is this is again where um this survey and the summary of the results like this um are pretty actionable and allow us to take action that will make them better for those that you know think they need improvement so Alternating between men and women is an interesting idea. That's why that's one reason why we've thought that um, having a dedicated a support group dedicated to women only might make other support groups like this one more efficient and effective. Alternating years since diagnosis, etc. Um, and a large percentage, of course, uh, chiming in that they like it just the way it is. So, anyway, just an, a, a small example of one of our support groups. Go ahead, Chad. I think we have one more on this topic. Oh, why have you not attended a pediatric support group recently? This is interesting. This also gives us ideas on how we make improvements like the 15% that thought the times were not convenient. So this might be something that we might take back to support group moderators and facilitators and say, do you want to run a straw poll with your attendees and ask for better um, support group times? That way we can make sure we're getting as many folks attending as can make it. Yeah, one thing I want to point out is the 6% who fear it would just get them depressed. That's where I was when I started out. Um, yeah. I didn't want to attend because I thought I would just get depressed. But I think all those 6%, um, gosh, I wish, I wish I could, you know, tell them how how valuable the support group has been to me and others who started off feeling that way. Mm -hmm. True. 
Okay, bounce to the next one, Chad. It, it looks like Christopher has a question. Next question, yes. Just a quick, it's kind of significant to me that the other category is 51%. So obviously the other options don't cover what 51% of the people thought were reasons not to attend. So. Yeah, that's. I'm glad you bring that up, Christopher. Um, we'll we'll see in a couple of slides coming up here that uh, several of our questions had an other option and an alternative for folks that wanted to select other to also include what that other might be. So if we had a list of five or eight or 10 responses that were pre-programmed and they could select for one or two of those, yeah. if they didn't like any of those, they could select the yeah. other box and then write in their answer. So what you don't hear, what you don't see here is a lot of free form responses in the text box. Um, yeah, but, but what I'm, what I'm, Pointing out is that sort of seems to be the, the biggest category here because uh, one would think the others would be, you know, just the smaller category because the major reasons would be covered with the other options. Right. This, this shows maybe we didn't do a perfect job. It is our first time asking a question like this. And, you know, we racked our brains. What are all the reasonable things people would have for reasons? And we right. came up with all the ones that we thought could think of. But you're right, 51% had other lot. comments. Sometimes when people say other comments, they just say, you know, N-A, or they mm -hmm. didn't quite understand. Um, but, but Chad's right. I mean, that. The, but the future there's survey. definitely um, our list of, of uh, ideas was not as comprehensive as right. it was for some other questions. Mm -hmm. When we do this, uh, we do so this uh, Kathleen also has a question. Kathleen, go ahead. My question re well, reverts to the question just previous to that, where you, the choices could be alternating men and women. Do you, I'm, I'm not sure what that means. Does it mean you'd only meet every other week? Well, like, there's different like ways. There's different ways to do this. We haven't taken action on this yet. Um, if it was an overwhelming desire, but but the problem that some people felt is it was not everyone got a chance to speak, or not everyone felt compelled to speak because the group was so large. Um, and so, if we alternated one week men, one week women, or another idea was um, three out of the four weeks a month, it would be combined. And then one week out of the month, men and women would meet separately, or maybe years since, maybe recently diagnosed would meet separately from the, you know, not so recently. So we were just, this isn't really, um, a uh, definitive for exactly how we would deal with this. This was just sort of gauging level of interest in if we were to try and offer smaller groups, what were people interested in? But you're right, it's not yeah. okay, good. It's not obvious what we would do. Um, and only 15% um, selected that. As um, Someone mentioned earlier, we are trying to, we got it, we've always had a lot of feedback for people wanting to have a women's only support group. Um, and so we're, we're working on it. That may be instead of alternating. David and Margo, do you have another question? Yeah, I have a comment. Um, I'm a member of the large support group that is on Thursdays at four o'clock. And there's anywhere from say 27 to 36 or 37 people on at any one time. And one of the things we kind of went through a process a couple, or maybe even started a year ago was different formats. And one of the formats we came up with was you split into smaller groups and then those groups all discuss things amongst themselves on a topic that the other groups are also discussing. And then they uh, appoint someone from their group 
to be the sponsor to carry the message of what that group was talking about. And that way, a lot of people that wouldn't normally speak in the uh, speak up in the larger meeting have the opportunity to speak up in the smaller. And there never was much difference, it seemed. It did that faded away because it does seem like if you go to enough of those support group meetings, you start seeing the same people doing the talking and this other group of people that aren't. And I don't know what you could do to change that, but that's pretty much how I envision it. There's people who talk <clears throat> in a consistent way from meeting to meeting, and there's people who don't. But everybody's yeah. eyes are open. Nobody's sleeping. Yeah. The, the breakout rooms can be effective in some formats. Um, I, I don't remember participating in any of those general support group sessions that you guys have had when you did have breakout rooms, but um, you know, David Cox agrees. David's tried a few breakout rooms, I guess, David, and uh, you'd like those, huh? Yeah. Thumbs up. The other David. Oh, yeah. The other David chatted. Oh, good. Uh, anyway, yeah, all good, all good ideas. Um, and like Chad says, these, these are not indicative of action we have taken. They're just, uh, sort of lobbing out ideas that could make the larger support groups, in this case, the general support group, um, function more smoothly. But, um, anyway, let's keep going, Chad, and people, folks can call us back to questions again in the, so for future programs. Uh, we ask this, um, this is sort of my sweet spot where I do the uh, events and I go out and recruit sp specialists um, to speak on different topics. And this is keen, key to some of those topics and specialists that we secure. So this is important. What topics are you particularly keen to learn more about in speaker forums or roundtables moving forward? Um, no surprise that prevention, treatment, and cure are at the top. Good for you. Um, as soon as I can find someone that can tell us about a cure, I promise we'll them on. But other than that, we do see a, a, a high recurring desire for more information on exercise and nutrition. Uh, for that reason, we've reached out, for example, already to Dr. Lori Misha, see if she might come back and give us an updated version of her talk that she gave last year, almost two years ago at this time. There are some of these topics that rank so high I and continue to rank high in every annual survey that we do, that we've decided as an as an events committee <clears throat> that we will try to touch on those topics on a semi-annual basis, an annual or semi-annual basis, um, exercising one of those latest meds and, and, and appliances might be another one, for example. DBS is usually ranks pretty high. Uh, anyway, you can see those in declining order of most importance. So this is what Monique and I and Kathy and Jen use to, to sort of beat the bushes out there on the internet to determine um, who's taught these topics out there, and can we, can you know, can we land them as a speaker for our members? If I could so just I point make... out, Christopher, look how much better we did on this question. The other <laughs> is way down in the bottom, and we got, we guessed a lot of the topics that people were interested in. Yeah, this year in the survey, I remember, Chad, we actually supplied these as drop downs so people could uh, select. You know, I think we did a select as many as you like kind of option in the in the question and they could select multiples. But what types of new or expanded programs would you like to see PD Active provide? And this is across the uh, the array of provided programs. <clears throat> more mental exercise and brain training classes, more physical exercise classes, more outdoor hikes and walks and picnics. And in a few minutes, we're going to lob up a few slides of examples of how we've actually taken some action since this survey was conducted to try to add some new and exciting content for our folks. Any questions on this slide? Okay, next. So this is where we start to get into some of the other comments. Um, and as we mentioned earlier in, in response to Christopher's question, a lot of our 
survey questions had an other box. And so that provided an opportunity for respondents to do some free form typing, which is really interesting. I mean, it happens to stretch out the tail of responses, right? And the and the types of responses are much more broad than than deep. Um, and some of them are fun and zany, and some of them are are quite meaningful and, and productive and stuff that we might not have thought about. So we, we're not showing that here just because some of them are private, but, we, but we've got all that. Um, and we use it, we actually pull it up in board meetings and we go through them on a practically a line by line basis. Um, for myself, I highlight the ones that are event specific and, and uh, the events committee re reviews those on our monthly meetings. Um, but some of them are really quite actionable. I mean, it may just be one or two people that say one specific thing in the response in the other field. And that, that's not a lot in the in the grand scheme of members that we've got out there. But if they sound interesting, we might just give them an experimental kick of the tires and see how it works. Next, Chad. Okay. Um, the takeaway that we want you all to uh, take away is that we hear you. Um, we take the feedback seriously and we've taken direct action as a result. So these surveys are not just um, exercises in curiosity. Um, and we're gonna talk about some of the things in the next couple of slides that we've done. Todd, you doing, you doing this? Sure. Uh, here are some examples of classes that we've added uh, because of uh, past feedback and past uh, surveys. The Zumba class with Andreina is very fun, and people seem to be liking that a lot. We're getting 20, I don't know, Kathy and Jen, 25-ish sort of on average with folks attending that on a weekly basis. Does that sound right? Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, you've been there. I've been there once or twice, but people love it. It's fun. I'm adding a new brain training class. Um, maintain focus on favorite classes like yoga and PD, yoga and tremolos. Uh, and, and and as we said earlier, all PD active online classes are now available without fees. So that was a indirect response to a feedback that we heard two surveys ago, not last year, but the one before. So um, that seems to be trending nicely with folks um, pleased that they don't have to pay on a class-by-class -class basis or event-by-event -event basis, but can do so in an annual uh, donate. David and Margo, question? You're muted. Okay, right. in response to feedback um, on support groups. I wanted you... to say something. Yeah, oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, one thing I always see missing from all these lists are the free classes out of Stanford. And I I don't know how they're attached or not attached to PD Active. I don't think they are, but I'm not sure. A woman's been teaching that class since 2016, and it's a class for people with Parkinson's exercise. It's two days a week. And now they've added a class, another free class on Mondays just for balance. And I announced that at the, my meeting at my support group, and I, there's one other, one or two other people that come some of the time, pretty regularly. But there's, there's when it's a Zoom class, you could have so many more people attending without any worries about having enough space to do something. So ha, I'm just asking the question: Have any of you ever heard of the classes? I've been taking them over a year. I, I know that Stanford uh, does offer various online programs for, and we stay in, we stay in pretty close touch with them at least because they publish a weekly email of all events, speaking right. events that are going on out there. So I'm not, I'm speaking more on the event side of things than the classes side of things that you're referring to. Um, so I personally don't know about the classes you're talking about, but it doesn't surprise me that they're available. Yeah, I just want wanted a way to somehow share that information with with PD Active. Right. Yeah. So, Kathy, maybe um, we could have a link if we don't already have it on the resource page where we list other services and programs. 
I'd be happy to sure, look idea. into it. Yeah. I, yeah, you can definitely put it on there. Good idea, Chad. Um, I also just wanted to flag that the um, this year, since the survey started, we started the two um, in-person classes uh, at the North Oakland Senior Center. Um, so those are um, hopefully will be in next year's survey, um, but those are also without fees. Um, and those are uh, great, I will say. That's the, the Zumba one is one of them. And um, and there's another, uh, Petra's doing another class there that's in person, mm -hmm. but those weren't, those have, those started since the survey was um, was done. At the And it's at the North Oakland Senior Center. And Petra's includes the brain training and exercise. Yes. That's great. Thank you for that feedback. We have a little on that in a couple of slides, but it's good to go cover it now. Um, Todd, whose turn is it? Mine or yours? Oh, my turn. Your okay. Turn. So in response to feedback on support groups, we started a DBS support group. Um, uh, for people who have or are considering uh, DBS or who are um, just uh, exploring, uh, we started African Americans Living with PD. Um, and uh, we continued all the many support groups. Here, Heart Circle and PD Salon are listed here. Um, and then all the other eight or so support groups we have, which is a lot. And um, as we've mentioned a couple of times, we're looking at options for women with PD support group. I'd like to comment, uh, this is Teresa Seabrook, by the way. I'd like to comment that the African-American group, uh, even though we've only had a couple of meetings, our group, numbers that have registered uh, has, I think, grown very nicely. When we first started, I expected, you know, an and for the year, uh, registered people to be like number 12 and six to a 10 regularly every week, or I'm sorry, not every week, every month. But the last time, well, this past week when I got the list of registrants, we're already up to 11 uh, people. So obviously my estimate was way too low. I'm really excited about it, even though I must say this past week, uh, there was only two of us that showed up, but I suspect that may be due to the holidays. Um, so I'm looking forward to, you know, continuing to work with that group. There seems to be a definite interest. That's really great. Thank you, Teresa. That's great. I'm glad to hear that, Teresa. I, I know a couple people emailed and said that they were at a conference and they were sorry to have missed your meeting. Right. And a couple of others did contact me and let me know that they would not be able to make the meeting for other reasons. Oh, that's good. I, I I don't know if the folks here in this group understand how it's a it's a significant goal of the PD Active Board to try to include, as Chad was mentioning earlier, uh, make make this group and the programs that we offer much more diverse. So I'm really glad to hear that from you, Teresa. Yes. The, the other thing that came out of the group is that they're looking forward to having more brown and black uh, instructors for the classes. Um, so that may be something that PD Active can consider. Um, and I have had a couple of instructors approach me with um, proposals. So I'd like to, you know, after the first of the year, submit those proposals as a consideration, different types of classes. Good, that, sure. That would be wonderful. We're always looking for qualified instructors and and there's value, as you mentioned, in reaching out to have more, more diversity in our instructors. Yes. Also, in response to feedback uh, for more in-person activities, we started the Zumba class that was in person, as Jen mentioned a moment ago, and the Brain Fit Cardio by um, 
Petra. Um, Sam and I also started a fun uh, monthly happy hours. We call it the happy shaky hours. Um, it's, it starts, it's, it's based in the YOPD support group, but it can be, it can include anyone. So we've been doing that for the past um, almost a year with some regularity. That's been fun. Um, we've continued our, our expanded in-person programming around pickleball, which is a gas. It's a lot of fun. A hiking group, picnics, the annual picnic that we have every spring, uh, the info fair. And another one that we're trying this Saturday is uh, a nature walk in Redwood Regional Park where we're going to where the uh, ladybugs collect tens and hundreds of thousands of ladybugs. And then we're gonna get a, natural, a naturalist with the Oakland Parks and Rec to come down and give us a walk through. So those are the kinds of things that we're trying to keep expanding based on the feedback that we're getting. One question I have regarding the um, the fees of classes, it seems to be confusion because um, different people have asked me, is the boxing program, um, is that sponsored by uh, PD Active? And if so, people are complaining that the fees are so high, it's cost prohibitive. Can right. you comment uh, on that? That's a, a very popular program. We don't sponsor it. We have a lot of our community that um, takes those classes. Um, that's a separate national, nationwide program. Um, uh, oh, so we, we have links to it. We list it on our calendar, but um, we don't we don't control the fees. We don't sponsor. Okay. We do cross promote Teresa, and uh, it's a nationwide organization called Rock Steady that is franchisable. So we've got Daniel. Uh, what's his last name, guys? Burkhart. Daniel Burkhart runs the Albany shop, and so we. We help him promote his business and put him up in the info fair, for example. But we don't, you know, we don't control the pricing, as Chad says. Okay. Um, if if you look at our calendar and our website, there's a triangle next to PD Active sponsored classes, and that might help you um, decipher between the PD Active sponsored classes and other classes in the community that we um, that we advertise for. Okay, I will let others know that um, because somehow people have gotten the idea that it is sort of supported by uh, PD Active, but we're disappointed at the cost. Right. Yeah, spread um, that word first. Tell them to come to Pickleball. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell them that. <laughs> Good. All right, Chad, take the next one. All right, um, Todd, this is right up your alley. Why don't you cover this sure, one? Thing. Sure, as as you saw, we're asking about, um, we ask a lot of questions about forums and roundtables and uh, we, we've gotten so much great response to um, in attendance terms to our roundtables and our speaker forums uh, in the past couple of years since having to go online with it those those numbers have blossomed um, nicely. Uh, for example, the Lori Mishley one that I referred to a minute ago had 250 attendees, not just registrants. The registrants were in the 300 range and 250 of those actually attended that day. And that's, uh, that's uh, our highest attendance rate of any of our speaker events for the past few years. Um, we've, because, because they've gone, the numbers have grown so much, we've added uh, in frequency, we've increased the frequency to be about one per month, and we've tried to alternate roughly for your expectations, um, a speaker form every odd, odd month, table every even month. We do vary those and mix in info fairs on some months and picnics and others. Um, but uh, they've been they've been successful. The roundtables are, uh, for those of you that haven't attended any other than this one, are generally smaller in size and more intimate and um, and collaborative and uh, uh, discussive in their format. Um, 
some of the expert speakers on the topics that you care about have been from um, where the wearables and technology and DBS industries. Uh, recently, we did a talk on gut microbiome from Stanford. Um, building your PD care team. You can see the rest of those there. And as we mentioned at the top, these are mostly uh, recorded. Sometimes speakers prefer not to be recorded, but most of them are recorded and put up on our YouTube channel for later viewing rather indefinitely. I've not seen any come down yet, so it's been, we're getting a pretty full channel up there. Any questions on roundtables and forums? Go chat. Uh, PD Active is by and for people with Parkinson's. Um, as many as 43 people taking the survey offered to volunteer for PD Active. Uh, this is an old photo. Um, we have some newer events I didn't get a photo in this uh, presentation in time for. For example, we had so many people at the UCSF symposium. We had uh, Kathy and Jen. You can probably describe the other um, uh, places where we used a lot of volunteers. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, this is a great way to get involved. And we really appreciate all the help. So there's Kathy's email down at the bottom if anybody on this call would like to lob their name into the hat. That's the way to do it. 43 folks responding to the survey said they'd be interested in volunteering. That's great. And there you see one of our own David Burks right there with his peace sign up. And Teresa. Yes. So we're you, Teresa, volunteers you well represented on this call today. <laughs> so, Thank <'cause>... you. <laughs> yeah. So that, that picture was actually from the, um, the Oakland Zoo. They did a, um, a healthy living festival. And right. so we do that. Uh, we've done that the past couple of years and it's been a great turnout. And so it's it's helpful for um, for our goal of diversity. So it's really helpful to have people come and volunteer for that. So if anybody's interested, please do contact me. And my email is right there. So. OK, so the final message is keep the feedback coming. Um, our 2024 survey will be here before you know it. <laughs> Any follow-up final questions before we sign off? David and Margo, you've got a lot of good All questions. Right. No? All right. I, I just say I appreciate you guys putting in the effort to conduct the survey and then share the results with us. They're very, uh, very, very useful. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. I wanted yeah. to say the same thing. Lauren and I are pretty new and it's just amazing. This community is phenomenal. Like, I don't know how I'd be getting through this without you guys. So oh. thank you. And thanks for this work. This is so encouraging to know that the organization like grows and changes so much. So anyway, thank you. Great. Yes, I'd like to say that the name PD Active is coming up more and more often uh, as I'm out and about interacting at um, different events and and um, classes, so forth. PD Active has earned their name in the community. <laughs> Who does the feedback go to? Yeah, I, I had one thing just thinking about that I've been thinking about for a while, and that is talking about how to get the information out about everything that's going on. And I was thinking of, would it be too much if we asked each support group to have a volunteer who would be a, a direct contact for Kathy to take the uh, all the information down to the meeting level and then disseminate it from there and maybe get more people uh, involved that way do you mean on a meeting by meeting basis notes from the support group meetings or well no 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 um information from pd active like the newsletter a lot of people i don't think even who get the newsletter maybe read it but if they were in their support group they'd be forced to listen to it unless they wanted to check out <laughs> they uh, could because our our meeting our support group has a review of the previous meeting mm -hmm. 
just to catch us up. And that way, I was, I was just thinking of ways to disseminate the information because it's all really cool events. Um, I, I try to send upcoming events and information to the coordinators for the different support groups um, to try to get the information out. Yeah. And I, I was going to add to that, that we are working on starting to get people who are going to the support groups to fill out the membership form. And that way, PD Active does have their email address and we'll send them information. And David, you're yeah. you're lucky. You're lucky to have that we have with us today our brand new uh, coordinator of all support group moderators, Miss Carrie Halmy. So, oh, good. Hi, Carrie. Carrie. So, like um, Carrie, could probably chat with the moderators and facilitators and and ask them about how, any ways they've got in mind for getting PD active information out to the members. Yeah, that's great, and uh, I really appreciate Roz too. She's if you could get one of her for every group that was needed support, it would be great with her philosophy and her outlook. She really is terrific. Quick question. Where does the feedback go? To the board. Okay. Yeah. But any particular person or is there oh. just an email address that it goes to? Well, whom should you send it to? That's what I'm asking. Oh, oh additional <laughs> feedback. Oh, you can you can send feedback to me um, or any of the the emails that you have for PD Active. And all the information for PD Active kind of goes to the board through either me or through info at pdactive.org. There are lots of ways to contact. Thank you. PDActive. Yeah. I'll just share one more quick thing I I I come across in the meeting, and that is we we, a couple of us asked a, a little while ago, Adam, about uh, having a list of email addresses. And he said, well, there's a privacy issue, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I said to him, well, I'm not saying you force them to send to give it to you, but you could be a clearinghouse and anybody who wanted to get in touch with the group or a member in the group, it would be a lot, a lot easier to do that. Anyway, that's just... Right. Yeah, it's something so many times people want to communicate with other people. I know um, for the, um, you know, we try and take a cautious approach when people yeah. say, oh, can I have so-and-so's email address who was talking about something or other in the last yeah. support group? Um, like 999 times out of a thousand, um, when you ask that person, oh, can I share your address? Um, they say yes. But there is a one out of a thousand, and this has happened where they say, you know, that person has been too forward for me. And, you yeah, know, it doesn't. Yeah, it's, it's a personal thing. I admit that. I just, yeah. I don't think it would be from the top down. It would be anyone who wanted to share their address. And then in the meeting, they could talk, say they were one of those people. And then if someone else, you know, a lot of times what happens is people piggyback on someone else's topic. You know, that's the way a lot of things get going. And then you're kind of stuck and everybody at the end is saying goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. But no one can follow through on the off time. It's all during the group. That's that's what I'm thinking of it for. Well, yeah. we, we can noodle on that. On how that might be, yeah, balancing the privacy and the yeah. openness. I mean, one option to think about is that you know, remember that these sessions often have chat features yeah. like this one does, and um, you can open up the chat bar and send a message directly to any of the attendees. Yep, yep. and ask for their email. <laughs> ask them for their yeah. email. Right. Exactly. Or, or give them yours is maybe another better approach and say if you've got them, yeah, email. yeah, if you want to email me back, sure. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments before we sign off? Kathy, Jen, Chad, any final thoughts? Thank you. Great job, Todd and Chad. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for everyone's support. Thank you for all for taking the survey and providing all the great feedback. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice rest of your Tuesday evening. You too. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Have a Bye. good night. Thanks so much.
good. There's more people than I thought. 